Our loving Lord, thank you for this opportunity we have to connect with you, with your word, and with this teaching today. I ask and pray that you'd open my mouth and open our ears. May we see Jesus as our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. There's a story that I love to share. Some of you may have heard me share it before, but it's, it's one of those stories that happens in life that you don't just tell once. You tell that story over and over and over again to remind you of the power of God's leading and what He does to work in incredibly amazing ways. It was 2008. In fact, it was July of 2008. And I was scheduled to make a trip to Russia to speak there on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of the Saratov Adventist Church that we had raised up through evangelistic meetings in 1993. Additionally, I was going to be teaching uh, for Andrews University at Zaoukski University there, just south of Moscow. So uh, this trip was going to last about a week, and, and so it worked out great to incorporate the visit to Saratov to celebrate their 15th anniversary uh, with this trip. At the time, we were living just north of Atlanta, Georgia, in the city of Calhoun, and we were about a little over an hour, hour and 20 minutes, depending on traffic, away from Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport there on the south side of Atlanta. And uh, I had planned uh, everything that day. It was a Thursday. I knew what time my flight left. I knew what time I needed to leave the house in order to make it there on time to, to get there for uh, my flight. And uh, I had everything ready to go. I had packed very simply. All I had was a backpack, and that backpack had my uh, change of clothing, my camera, and just the little bit I needed. And since it was a very hot, humid summer day there in Georgia, I was dressed with a, a travel shirt and a pair of shorts and uh, on my way to the airport. And as I was driving to the airport, uh, some things started to happen. Now, I knew that I had calculated plenty of time to make it uh, for my flight. I had even calculated for some traffic challenges, but apparently not enough because on the north side of Atlanta, I hit a huge traffic jam with an amazing accident, and it delayed me. And I'm watching the clock tick by, and I'm saying, oh my goodness, am I going to be able to make this flight? Am I going to get there in time? And, and I'm praying, and I'm sweating, and, and, and my pulse is racing, and my blood pressure, I'm sure, was elevated as I'm, I'm stressing out. I got on the 285 freeway heading around uh, the uh, outer loop of uh, Atlanta on my way to Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport when the sky opened up and there was thunder and there was lightning and there was a humongous, humongous storm. Now listen folks, those of us in Southern California do not know thunderstorms like they do in the South. I mean, this was absolutely incredible. The sky opened up, and we're talking about turning a fire hose on. It was just buckets coming out of the sky, and traffic slowed down on the freeway to a crawl because there was so much water on the freeway. And, 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 and I'm looking at my clock, and I'm stressing out even more because I'm seeing, wow, am I going to make my flight? We're getting closer to uh, the exit to the airport when uh, the, it was still raining, a bit, not as much as it had been. There was another accident there that detained me even more. I finally exited the freeway there and went to the parking uh, facility that I always used when I would, would, would fly out. And I, I made my way there and I waited for the shuttle to come around. And here I am with my backpack. I'm dressed in this travel shirt and shorts. The sky opens up again and just hoses me as I'm standing there. And I'm looking at my, my watch and I'm saying, man, there's no way I'm going to make this, this flight. Finally, the shuttle comes and it picks me up. And we're on our way to the airport. Now, most of you are aware that when you're going to fly, you need to allow yourself plenty of time whether it's domestic or international. If you're flying internationally, you've got to allow even more time to get checked in and to go through that whole process. By now, folks, so much time had gone by and I'd lost so much time. I'd calculated myself to be there well ahead of two hours before my departure. I, about, I had allowed myself about two and a half hours. 
But now, because of all of these delays, my flight was going to leave in a little less than an hour, and I had just barely gotten on the shuttle. As we're driving in the shuttle bus towards the airport, the, the um, uh, bus driver, he calls out to this jammed shuttle bus. He says, listen, folks, he says, I've just been notified uh, that there's another ac uh, accident uh, on the road to the airport. We were probably about a mile away from the airport, and he says, listen, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because he says, if any of you've got tight connections, he says, I don't know how long we're going to be stuck in traffic here. That's all I needed to hear. Again, my heart was racing. My, my pulse was elevated. My, my blood pressure was high. I'm standing there, and the guy next to me, as I'm standing up inside the bus holding on to the rail there, um, guy standing next to me, he said, you have a tight connection? And I said, very tight connection. He says, where to? And I says, uh, Moscow, Russia. He immediately whips out his cell phone and his smartphone, and, and, and he, he enters in. He says, what's the flight number? And he, he did it, and he says, oh, my goodness. He says, um, I don't know how you're going to make it. He says, uh, there, it just says that they're going to be boarding in a few minutes. I don't know how you're going to make it. My heart was pounding, and, and I, I knew um, in my heart that uh, if I would make it, that it would be uh, that the odds were, were next to impossible as I was contemplating uh, the situation. Here's the other challenge. It was Thursday afternoon, and I was not going to be arriving in Moscow until Friday morning, and I still had another 15-hour uh, drive from, Surat from uh, Moscow to Saratov by car. Some people were going to be picking me up, and... Uh, I was barely going to arrive in time to preach on Sabbath morning. I figured I would get in at uh, the early hours on Sabbath morning. And I knew that there was no fudge because if I missed this flight, I would not make my preaching appointment there in the city of Saratov. I knew I was facing impossible odds. This morning, as we share this time together, would you open your Bibles to... The, the 10th chapter of the book of Joshua. We're going to take a look at a story. A story in the scripture where the people of God were facing incredibly impossible odds. Now, let me give you a little background to what we find here in Joshua chapter 10. You remember that as we open the story of the book of Joshua, the children of Israel have just crossed into the promised land. They're facing the battle of Jericho. That takes place. God gives them victory over Jericho. And then they have their first battle at Ai. Now you remember the first battle of Ai. It was just a small town, but they lost that battle because of the sin of Achan. Achan had stolen some goods from Jericho. And, uh, and God uh, uh, took that out on, on Israel. And as a result... Israel lost that battle of Ai. And then after that, they had the second battle of Ai when God finally did give them victory. And then you remember after that, they were going about in looking, surveying the land to conquer uh, the, the land of Canaan. And there were a group of people that came up to them and told them that they were from a foreign country and wanted to know if, if the Israelites would take them in and all of this kind of stuff. It happened to be the Gibeonites. And you remember the deception of the Gibeonites when they lied? They were actually inhabitants of the land of Canaan. But they saw what happened to Jericho. They saw what happened to Ai, and they said, Oh man, we're going to be toast too if we don't quickly enter into some kind of a treaty. Remember, they deceived Joshua and the children of Israel. And Joshua entered into a treaty with the Gibeonites. And then the truth became known that the Gibeonites were lying to them. But the treaty had already been made, and, and God insisted that they keep that treaty. And, and as a result, this angered the other inhabitants of the land of Canaan. There were five kings there in that region of Canaan. And these kings were enraged about what Gibeon had done. And they wanted to go and take it out on the Gibeonites. And so these five kings there of Canaan, they rallied to their troops together and they started after the Gibeonites and the Gibeonites were freaking out. And they said, oh, wow, our fellow, fellow countrymen of Canaan are going to take it out on us. And they sent message, a message to Joshua and they appealed to Joshua that something would happen 
that Joshua would intervene. And so if you will take a look in Joshua chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up with verse 6. It says, And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp, of, uh, at, the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal. He and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. Now this is interesting. Verse 9 says that, uh, that he had been, Joshua had been marching his men of war all night long. And here they come for this grand showdown with all these five kings of the Amorites. And verse 10 says, So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. Verse 11, And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. God rallied the forces of heaven, and he wiped out these five kings of the Amorites and all of their troops. But the story doesn't end there. Notice what happens next. There are still more that need to be destroyed. And verse 12 says, Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of, Lord, of, of, of uh, Israel, Sun stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Agilon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Apparently it was getting late in the day and Joshua said, man, we've got business we need to finish. Yeah, we've routed these guys already. We, we've sent them on the run. And God sent hailstones down from heaven and killed a bunch more, but there are still more on the run. And we've got to finish our business because we don't want to have to face this enemy again. And so Joshua calls out to the God of heaven and he says, God, I want you to make the sun stand still. Don't let the moon move. And then notice what it says in verse 13. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. The sun is standing still for a whole day. And verse 14, And there has been no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, to the camp of Gilgal. The enemy was struck down. They were wiped out. God caused the sun to stand still for about 24 hours. And in that time, Joshua and his forces wiped out the kings of the Amorites and all of their armies. Now, what about this idea that the sun stood still? A lot of people are troubled with that idea. It's not my intent today to get hung up on explaining what happened that day when the sun and the moon stood still. We're talking about the complex laws of nature, astronomy, and physics. And I'll tell you right now that I'm no scientist. The fact of the matter is that most scientists don't have a definitive explanation for what happened that day either. Because there seems to be no mutually agreed upon conclusions regarding the phenomenon, biblical critics blow it off and say, now, it's just folklore, it's fairy tale. Didn't happen. In fact, some pundits claim that the sun and the moon didn't alter their course and that no actual miracle was involved. The description in Joshua chapter 10 is simply the use of poetic language, they say. Critics, in fact, claim that Israel had fought so hard that it just seemed like two days 
worth of battle. But just because we don't have a humanly plausible explanation, does that mean the events of Joshua 10 didn't happen? Because our human minds are intrigued and curious about events like this, let me suggest a few possibilities regarding the story of the sun standing still. First of all, I want to again stress the fact that these are only possibilities, not absolute conclusions. But first, let me clarify one important point. From a, an astrological perspective, the sun couldn't have stood still because the earth rotates around the sun, not the sun around the earth. So does that dis immediately discredit the story? Not if you understand the idiomatic expression that Joshua used here. The phrase, sun stand still, is no different than our expression that we use about the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun. And all uh, the human race around the world has used that term for a long time, talking about sunrise and sunset, when in actuality that doesn't happen. So let me share with you some possible explanations to Joshua chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, or 12 and 13, rather. Number one, this is one possibility of the sun standing still. Both the earth and the moon stop their rotational and orbital process. The text is what it is. They actually physically stopped. Now, let's think about that. The prophet Habakkuk refers to the event when he says in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went. At the shining of your glittering spear you marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people. If this indeed happened, then God would have had to put the entire universe on pause because of the interplay of the heavenly bodies. In other words, our entire solar system would have had to come to a screeching halt, not just planet Earth. And if our solar system was paused, then our galaxy, the Milky Way, had to be paused. And if the Milky Way had been paused, then the entire universe would have ha had to have been put on pause because all of these heavenly beings, uh, 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 organisms, uh, work in, in a system. Could that have happened? Well, the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus makes it clear that with God all things are possible. So it is possible that option no number one happened. Option number one regarding the phenomenon on described in Joshua 10, is that God hit the pause button on the entire universe that day. Option number two, the Lord could have put the entire universe into slow motion, slowing down the rotational and orbital process of all the heavenly bodies, even slowing down the speed of light. It's possible that that happened. Option number three, the illusion could have been created through the process of refraction, uh, refractive light or the bending of light rays. Could that have possibly happened? Well, let me give you something else to consider. When one assembles all of the passages of Scripture regarding the second coming of Jesus, it seems that everyone will see the coming of Jesus. Revelation chapter 1-7 says that every eye will see him. So how is that possible that someone on this side of the planet will see him at the same time that somebody on the op exact opposite side of the planet will see him? Is that even possible? Some have suggested that yes, it is through the process of something known as refractive light. Is it possible then that God could, use refract could have used refractive light for Joshua in the Valley of Agilon? And is it possible that he would use the same process at the second coming of Jesus. Okay, those three options. Here's option number four. Perhaps this whole process of the sun standing still was actually an illusion because the land of Gibeon was illuminated with the presence of God. 
Now follow my reasoning. The Bible tells us that uh, um, uh, of a time and place when the so light of the sun will not be needed. If you turn to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23, you read, The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is the light. In other words, God, Jesus, produces the light in the New Jerusalem. And listen to Isaiah chapter 60, verses 19 and 20. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor uh, for brightness shall the moon give light to you. But the Lord will be to you an everlasting light. And your God, your glory, your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your morning shall be ended. In the New Jerusalem, will the earth stop its rotational and orbital process around the sun? Not at all. But the occupants of the New Jerusalem will not be aware of the rising or the setting of the sun because the visible presence of God will illuminate the holy city. Is it possible then that the light shown during the battle of Joshua in Gibeon was nothing more than the visible presence of God? After all, we know from the text that God was present there. He sent hailstones down. He sent his uh, angels to, to be some of the forces to take on these uh, kings of the Amorites. Perhaps God made his presence visibly known. Yeah, the sun continued its orbit, but it appeared as though night never came because God was present there. If, as a believer, you accept this story in the Word of God, then no matter which explanation you pick, it's undeniable that it was a miracle. And miracles are the unexplainable involvement of supernatural divine intervention. The event of Joshua 10 was a God thing and simply couldn't have happened without divine in involvement. If God couldn't perform the miracle described in Joshua 10, then he couldn't and can't perform any miracle. To put it in the words of Christian author Warren Wiersbe in his book, Be Strong, quote, either we believe in a God who can do anything, or we must accept a Christian faith that's non-miraculous and that does away with the inspiration of the Bible, the virgin birth, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the book Miracles by C.S. Lewis, Lewis wrote, quote, The mind which asks for a non-miraculous Christianity is a mind in process of relapsing from Christianity into mere religion. There are rumors that have been circulated for more than a century now, and most recently fueled by the advent of the Internet, that NASA computers have proven Joshua's long day. Well, let me say, folks, it's nothing more than urban myth. But the Bible is no urban myth, and it says in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 35, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and it, its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. In Psalm 74, 16, it says, The day is yours, the night also is yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. In Mark chapter 4, and verse 41, And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? The disciples recognized the power of Jesus, that he had power over the heavenly forces. While we can't fully explain what happened that day from a scientific perspective, I'm not sure that a scientific explanation is essential. The Bible is not meant to be a scientific textbook. There are scientific events that happen in the context of Scripture that the Bible does not fully explain. So does that mean that the Bible and science are in conflict? Does that mean that the Bible and science are mutually exclusive? 
Does that mean that we can't trust the Bible because certain events are not scientifically explainable? Does that mean that when we encounter stories like Joshua chapter 10, that we throw the baby out with the bathwater simply because there's no plausible human explanation? Friends, if one always has to have proof, if one always has to have evidence, where does faith enter in? And thus, the title of our sermon series. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. The problem that exists is that most people today want to walk by, by sight and not by faith. We want everything explained before we can accept it. I honestly believe that when Jesus comes again, that there's going to be those trying to give a scientific explanation as the rocks and mountains are falling on them. I told you that I'm no scientist, but I am a theologian. And the theologically significant question for me is how can finite man explain the intricacies of an infinite God? In other words, how can my pea brain encapsulate the one who created me. Our attempt to do so, or even a desire to do so, is to play with the same fire that Lucifer played with when he questioned God in heaven. That's what initiated the entire great controversy in the first place. We continue to play Satan's game when we call into question God's character and his way of operating the universe. Ellen White says in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, referring to this event in Joshua 10, quote, In this miracle, all who exalt nature above the God of nature stand rebuked. The problem with the human race is that we continue to fall for Satan's lie to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5, Satan said to her, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The human race is not simply content with being like God. We want to be God. And Satan has done a masterful job in confusing us, because in reality, our greatest need is God. I won't spend any more time debating or postulating what happened on the day when the sun stood still there in Gibeon, because quite frankly, I don't believe it's the point of the story. If it were the point of the story, then God would have revealed the minute details and process that he went through to create this scientific phenomenon. And I'm troubled by those who are constantly attempting to make that which is not the main point, the main point. The fact of the matter is that while the astrological wonder that happened that day is not the main point. It serves to prove the points or lessons from this story. So let's quickly take a look at the lessons from this story. As we face the events at the end of time, I believe that this story reveals five lessons that give us courage to walk by faith. Lesson number one, the Gibeonite example. When this heathen group of people who had deceived Joshua and the Israelites experienced challenging times, they remembered the process, or the promise rather, of Joshua, whose name means Yahweh is Savior, and sought protection and help from him. These past four months of the global pandemic seem like a very, very long day. Or, we might say, a very long nightmare. We are overwhelmed, wondering when it will ever end. But taking our cue from the Gibeonites, as we face this trial and all the challenges of life, we too should remember the promises of Jesus, which is in the Greek ren a rendering of Joshua. That's what the name Jesus in the Greek means, the same as Joshua in the Hebrew. And, and in him, seek protection and help from the one, Yahweh, is Savior, the one who will never leave us nor forsake us. So, number one, lesson number one, follow the example of the Gibeonites. Lesson number two, the Joshua success factor. Joshua believed the divine promise of deliverance that we read about here in this story in 
Joshua chapter 10, that God was with him. And that's why he called upon the Lord in Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, to ask the sun to stand still. Likewise, we will only find our success in Jesus and our victory in Him if we note the Joshua success factor. Lesson number three has to do with the omnipotence of God. The miracle of the hailstones in verse 11 that only took out the enemy and not the people of God indicates that God is all-powerful. They were strategically targeted missiles that took out this heathen, rebellious, godless nation. This, ha this fact has strong eschatological implications. During the great battles waged, during the final scenes of earth's history, God will fight the battle for us. Think about this assurance in the context of the current global coronavirus pandemic. God was all-powerful in Joshua's day, and God is all-powerful today. Though the inspiration, or through the inspiration of, 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 of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 16 describes the seven last plagues and the destructive power of hail upon those who refuse to follow Jesus. Lesson number four, the sovereignty of God. The miracle of the longest day indicates that God is in control and all nature obeys His commands, so why shouldn't we? Why did God cause the sun to stand still? Why didn't He just immediately annihilate all the Amorites? He could have done it. Because God's ways are not man's ways. And again, the story of Joshua 10 reminds us that God is in control. And we also need to be remembered that God only honored the wish of Joshua. It's possible that if Joshua's prayer to God would have been, hey, Lord, strike all the Amorites right now, just put an end to this, it would have happened. But no, he didn't do that. Joshua was the one that asked God to cause the sun to stand still. Lesson number five, the compassion of God. God cares enough about his people that he's willing to intervene in their personal affairs. Sometimes I feel so overwhelmed with my list of things to do that I'd love to ask God to cause the sun to stand still so that I could just get caught up. You ever feel that way? I'm sure you have. In fact, I saw a poster one time that said, quote, I was put on this earth to accomplish a certain number of things, but right now I'm so far behind that I'll never die. I think back to that experience. As I was on that bus on my way, that shuttle bus on my way to the Atlanta airport, there was no humanly possible way that I was going to make it on board that flight. I felt like Joshua, I felt like calling out to God and saying, hey God, cause the sun to stand still, you know, freeze time in its place so that I can make that flight. I didn't quite go to that extreme, but I was, my heart was crying out to God. God, I need a miracle right now. As I told you, there was a tr huge traffic jam because of an accident, and, and the bus driver said, listen, we're going to be in this for a while. And one of the guys on the shuttle bus called out to the driver, and he says, well, do you know that if you go up here one block and you turn right, and you go down such and such a, a street, and you turn left, you, go, you will have immediate access to the terminals. And the bus driver says, oh, you know what, I forgot about that. Now, the bus driver should have known that. He regularly took that route. So he did that. And here we are in front of the terminal. And everybody knew that I was pressed for time. So, you know, the, the waters parted like the Red Sea, that the people parted there. And, and I raced through. And, and they were all cheering me on as I left the bus. And here I'm still soaking wet. And I've got my backpack. And I'm running like crazy to get in the doors of, of the airport there to go and check in to my flight. And I went to went in there and it was just absolute chaos there in that, in that uh, area of, of the international flights and, and, and Delta Airlines. And, and I didn't even know where to go, but I saw a uniformed Delta uh, a person there and I walked up to the man and I said, sir, I'm in a big trouble. I'm scheduled to be on such and such a flight to Moscow and it leaves in just about 30 minutes. And the guy says, oh man, he says, I don't think there's any way you can make it. But he says, come with me. And I followed him and we're running like crazy. And he takes me to a back area and he opens up a counter there with a computer. And, he, and 
He says, I need your passport. I handed him my passport, and he's typing in all this information the whole time. He's just shaking his head, and it didn't look good. I'm just waiting there, and I'm continuing to pray. And a couple of minutes later, he reaches out, and he hands me something. And I says, what is this? He says, it's your boarding pass. And I said, I'm on? And he says, well, he says, you, can, you will be if you get to the terminal in time, to the gate. Now listen, it happened to be at gate F. And if you've ever been to Hartsfield-Jackson, uh, not gate, terminal F, if you've ever been to Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, you know that that's the farthest terminal away. And I was at the farthest gate. I think I was at gate 34, and I was the farthest away. And it's more than a mile from the main terminal all the way to that point. Now, they have a shuttle service, a train that takes you, but it has to make all these stops. And, of course, I had to get through, through uh, security just to get there. And I start running, man. I'm running as fast as I can, and I get to security, and I see this huge line. And one of the TSA agents sees me there looking in despair, and she says, Sir, what's the problem? And I explained to her. She says, Come with me. And I followed her, and she took me through some back areas and, and right to the front of the line. And, and I had no line whatsoever. And she says, Go right through here. And I went through there, and I'm running down the stairs to get on the train. And I get on the train, and I'm going there, and I finally get off at, at that terminal, Terminal F. I have to run up this, the, take up the, go up the escalator to get to my gate and then down the, down the end of the terminal. And I finally get there to that gate and there isn't anyone there. Not a single soul. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm too late. By this time, it was only a couple of minutes till departure. Literally a couple of minutes till departure. And as I'm running in there, all of a sudden, a, a, a Delta agent came out from behind a wall and she said, Mr. White? And I says, yes. She says, we've been waiting for you. Welcome aboard. I got on that flight and I sat in my seat and I'm telling you, it probably took me the first two and a half hours just to gain my composure. But I made it. I made it. The impossibility. When I finally landed that next morning, there Friday morning in Moscow at Cheremetyevo Airport, my party was there to, to greet me, Pasha Kostenko and um, Dima Koganov and Sveta Gavello. They were there waiting for me that morning, had a huge sign there. And I was so relieved to see them. And we got in the car and we're driving the 15 hours to, to the city of Saratov. And as we're sitting there talking, I began to share with them the events of the day before and how I almost didn't make it. And then Sveta tells me this amazing story how at that very same time that I was detained, that they were too. They went through a small city there in Russia on their way to Moscow, and a police officer detained them for a couple of hours, took their passports, took all their documents, was going to impound their car, claimed that they had done something illegal, I think was looking for some kind of a bribe, and they began to plead with them, we've got to get to the airport, we've got a friend coming in. And Sveta said, we were all concerned, we were in prayer, because we knew that if you arrived and we didn't, you wouldn't know what to do. Now, this was in 2008, before the means of modern technology that we have now that would have allowed uh, communication and messaging and that kind of stuff. But she says, we didn't know what to do. And so we saw that at that moment, the forces of good and evil were playing out. That the enemy was trying to keep me from getting there on my side and from them picking me up. But God was in control. The same God who was in control in Joshua's time is the same God that's in control today. The same God who took out the Amorites is the same God who can take out the coronavirus, who can deal with all of the impact that it's bringing. But he doesn't just want to take out the pandemic of the coronavirus. He wants to take out the pandemic of sin. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 46 and verse 1. He says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble was 37 years ago this month that I finished graduate school and headed for my first pastoral assignment in Rock Springs, Wyoming. And if you would have asked me if we would still be on this planet in the year 2020, I would have said, not a chance. Jesus certainly will have come by then. But here we are, and we're still waiting. Or are we? In reality, friends, 
We're not waiting on Jesus. He's waiting on us. He's waiting for us to allow Him to take control. And so I ask you this question, are you willing to allow Jesus to control your life and all of the issues that you have? Are you willing to allow Jesus to prepare your heart for His soon return? I love that old-time gospel song. He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got the little bitty babies in His hands. I remember my dad teaching me that song when I was a kid. He, he'd play it on the guitar. He's got you and me brother in his hands. He's got you and me sister in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain in his hands. And yes, folks, he even has the global pandemic in his hands. He's got you and me in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. I love the words of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 33. Verses 26 and 27, There is no one like the God of Jeshurun, who rides the heavens to help you, and in His excellency on the clouds, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you, and will say, destroy. Oh, my friends, that's good news. Won't you allow Jesus to keep you in the palm of your hands today? He's got the whole world in His hands. Listen as Art and Sharon play that wonderful song. Amen. Amen. He's got the whole world in his hands. Does he have you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this inspiring story. A story that helps us to understand that you are an all-powerful God. You may not be an explainable God. We, we can't understand your ways, but it doesn't matter. Because in the end, you have an incredible love for us. Thank you so much. Thank you for your desire to put an end to the pandemic of sin. We want you to take us in your hands today. We want to be ready to see you face to face. May that day be soon when we will not experience the trials and troubles of life on this planet anymore, but spend the ceaseless ages of eternity with you in that world made new. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.